uh, project that we have coming up, we're gonna need all hands on deck for that. We have, uh, uh, everyone will have an opportunity to be involved in it either prior to, as we have the work days that we prepare, or uh, certainly um, on December 9th and 10th, when we have that uh, from 6 to 8 p.m. here at the church. Just a quick uh, commercial for uh, Joy Club. Um, this is the book that we're going through in Joy Club. That is on Fridays, 11 to noon. Um, we have a good group of people, uh, and we'd uh, certainly welcome anybody uh, who would like to come and to uh, study with us. Uh, after the first year, uh, we're going to start up the Bible Institute again. We're going to have Bible Institute um, on finances and um, biblical finance. So uh, I'll be teaching that. You can learn from all the mistakes I've made in my life. I'd be a multimillionaire if I hadn't made so many mistakes, right? <laughs> we all would be. But uh, also, we offer a class on uh, membership. Here at NCC, which John mentioned earlier also, um, and it's coming up next week, Tuesday the 15th at 6.30 p.m. Um, we hope you, you might attend if you're not a member. In that class, we cover the tenets of our faith, our beliefs as a local church body. Uh, these materials in the class, uh, it's called NCC 101. Uh, the, the, this class is made up years ago as a requirement to take your membership here. So, um, uh, number one, we, we cover, why are we here? Why, why do we even exist? Um, God made us to, to have a relationship with him. Uh, so what's the problem? Sin is the problem. All the sin and fall short of the glory of God. We have no relationship with him, uh, with our sin. Um, there's no way that we can save ourselves. So what's the solution? God demonstrated his love for us in the while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So God wants us to admit and confess our sin, believe that Jesus died and, and rose again for our sin, accept God's free gift of salvation, and invite Jesus to come into our lives as our Lord. That's the gospel of Christ in a nutshell. Until we submit to Christ and make him our Lord, our, the Lord of our lives, we're headed to an eternity in hell. And Lord equals obedience, right? If somebody is our Lord, we're going to obey uh, them. So, anyway, let's have a word of prayer before we go into our message uh, this morning. Father, again, we thank you for a wonderful day that you've given to us, the, the beauty of, of your creation. Uh, we ask, Lord, now as we open your word, that your spirit would speak to our hearts in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, we go into, uh, at our class, we go into a core belief of our church that there are two ordinances that were given to us uh, by Christ that he, he left for the church. Believer's baptism is, is one, and the Lord's table, which you'll partake in today here, uh, is the other, which many of us refer to as communion. Both of these ordinances are not just suggestions, but we find them as commands uh, in Scripture. Well, there, there's always some discussion um, that, that we have in the class exactly what it means to be baptized, why do I do it, um, or if I was baptized as a child, does, does that count? Do I really need to be baptized uh, again? Next month, um, First Sunday of the month, we're going to cover the other ordinance, which is the Lord's table. Um, there are various reasons um, that people who profess faith in Jesus Christ may never have been baptized. It's important to note that, that we as a church and as church leaders have a responsibility uh, to bring you the whole counsel of God, uh, what the Word of God says. Another core belief of our church is that the Bible is inspired by God. It is the basis of our initial belief, and it's the basis as to how we are to live our lives. It is how we come to know God. This book is God's revelation to us as to who he is and to how to know him. Our church constitution notes that immersion is the form of baptism that we practice as a church 
And not only that, the church founders believed in that in such conviction is right there is uh, a tank that um, we baptize people in. They built a baptistry right into the church. Um, so today we're going to take a look at this subject. And we already looked at some of Deuteronomy chapter 6. If you want to open up your Bibles to there, uh, we're not going to read it again. Um, but we'll, we'll go through it and go through some of the other verses there that we did not read. Again, the, the title of the message is Love and Obedience. Um, and I think we understand that concept. We're also going to look at, real quickly, at 2 John um, chapter 1, verse 6. But um, verses 1 through 3 of Deuteronomy uh, chapter 6 has commands, statutes, and rules um, that God expects his people to follow. Uh, they are to follow these commands as they go into the land that God has promised them. They are to fear the Lord their God. And not only each of us, but also those people were to teach, and we are to teach it to our children and our grandchildren all the days of our lives. Be careful to do that. He reminds them. And there's a promise that if you obey it, it will go well with you. Uh, you'll multiply You'll be blessed. How many of us don't want to be blessed? Don't want uh, to multiply. We read, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Verse 4, you, verse 5, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. Here's the connection of love and obedience. And these words that I command you today, verse 6, shall be part of or shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children and talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down and when you rise. That's all the time, right? The word of God is not just for Sunday school or church on Sunday. It should be opened and taught in our homes, not only to our children, but to our grandchildren. And then it says you shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. We should see everything through the lens of Scripture. Whether we're watching TV, whether we're on our computer, whether we're talking to someone, everything should come through the eyes of the lens of, of Scripture. You shall write them on the doorpost of your house. There's a sign I'm looking at right now. I will be exalted. I don't know how many of you have signs in your house or um, artwork that depicts scripture, but that's scriptural to do. What we see here, the, the word of God is to be on our hearts. We're to teach to our children and talk. And when we walk, when we talk, when we do anything, the word of God should be part of us. Verse 10, and the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers and gives you all these great things. Verse 12 says, Then take care lest you forget the Lord. How many of us forget the Lord in our life? We do it every single day. We forget the blessing. God knows that we're forgetful people. After all, he's the one who created us. When we are blessed with material things, we tend to forget the one who blessed us. Verse 13 says, It is the Lord your God who shall fear. We shall, should have respect. We should have love for him. It's not the same kind of fear that we should cower from him, but we should be attracted to him through his word. He says, You shall have no other gods. And don't go to the gods of the people around you. How many times do we do that, right? Your God is a jealous God. He wants a relationship with you. And how many times do I go throughout my day where I might forget that relationship and the things that I do, the things that I say? But he's a jealous God that we are to fear lest the anger of the Lord your God can He's jealous. A jealous God desires a relationship. Our relationship with God is based on faith, but it results in obedience. We're taught in the word of God. 
What are these other gods that are around us? The world, our culture that we live in is full of them. It could be sports, it could be politics, it could be uh, tangible items that, that we own, it could be our homes, <clears throat> any material possessions that we have. Anything we put between ourselves and God is an idol. Anything that we do. He continues on, um, <clears throat> and he says, You shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God. You shall do what is right in the sight of the Lord. Verse 18. Do we follow God's law in our lives? Do we always do what is right in his eyes? When we don't, do we confess it? Here's an interesting thing. When your son, verse 20, asked you in time to come, what is the meaning of the testimonies and statutes and rules that the Lord uh, our God has commanded you? Then you shall say to your son, we were, in Pharaoh's, we were Pharaoh's slaves in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and grievous against Egypt, against Pharaoh, and all his household before our eyes. And he brought us up from there that he might bring us in and give us the land that he swore to give to our fathers. And the Lord commanded us to do all these statutes, to fear the Lord for our good always, that he might preserve us alive as we are to this day. When our children ask us, why do we go to church? Why do we get baptized? Or some of them might say, I don't want to go to church. Our first response should be what my mother's was. If you sleep in this house, you go to church. <laughs> Pretty good rule. But our response should be uh, our testimony. Testimony of God's love, God's patience, and forgiveness of our sin. We see people in our culture today who are slaves to sin. We should praise God before them, before others, about the great miracle of salvation that he gave to us, about our fear or reverence for God, for who he is, and then all the glory for that goes to him. It says in verse 25, and it will be righteousness for us if we are careful to do this commandment before the Lord our God as he has commanded us. Remember, that is a parent telling the child, teaching the child. The testimony and statutes symbolize God's salvation to his people. God says when your son asks, what's the meaning of all of this? We need to respond. It's interesting that God is a God of symbols. What's the first symbol he gave? Well, I shouldn't say the first, but he placed a rainbow in the sky, right? The rainbow had a meaning. It came with a promise that he would never destroy the earth in the same way again. He had his people choose the choice land and slay it with very specific instruction as to how to do that, how to prepare it, what to do with the blood. Initially, he said, put it on your doorpost and the death angel will pass over you when they were in Egypt. They still celebrate the Passover today. There were others also when they were crossing the Jordan. In Joshua chapter 4, you can look that up, make a note of it. Uh, verses 5 through 7, he instructs them to take up each of you a stone upon his shoulder according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel. And this may be a sign among you when your children ask in time, what are these stones? Okay, you should tell them about the waters of Jordan that were cut off and that you were able to cross. So these stones, it says here, shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever, a symbol. God uses symbols. We could go on and on about the symbolism, symbolisms that God provided in the instruction that he wanted them for uh, to the next generation and beyond. God uses symbols for a purpose. It's easy for us to forget, right? We were just reminded of that in Deuteronomy chapter 6. He knows that we are dust. 
we purposefully partake in the Lord's table, which we'll do later here, uh, for this very reason. It's a regular remembrance for us, for Christ's sacrifice, for our sin. We're instructed to do it as often as we do it. The grape juice represents his blood. The bread, his body, sacrificed for us. Again, even in the New Testament, God has set up symbolism so that we do not forget what he has given us. It's also a time where we are to confess and repent of our sin. God remembers we're forgetful. It is our responsibility to know what God expects. And that is why we are examining this here today. When we love someone, we want to please them. In 2 John chapter 1 and verse 6, it says this, And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, so that you should walk in it. God gives us commandments, and in our love, our appreciation for what has been done for us, we obey. Love leads to obedience. Why does God save sinners? If you want to turn to Ephesians chapter 2, we're going to take a, a look at that. But God does not save you and I just to go back and live the lives that that we were living before. James says, so faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead faith. Every saves us, God expects us to be obedient to him. And one of those areas of obedience is baptism. However, being baptized has absolutely nothing to do with our salvation, does it? It is a result of our salvation. Baptism is obedience driven by our love for him. We love him because he first loved us. As we go into this study, it's important that we know what baptism is not. It has nothing, absolutely nothing to do with our salvation. Again, it is obedience to Christ's command, which we're going to look at here. Driven by love. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this, this is not your own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast, right? So I can't boast about anything. Certainly, I should be ashamed of myself for many of the things I've done. But verse 10 tells it all. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Note that although salvation is a gift and not a result of works, we are created for good works. Our salvation results in obedience to God. Being baptized does not and cannot save you, but following God's instruction, obedience is a result of our love for Christ because of our salvation. It says God prepared and wanted us to follow beforehand. How do we know what those things are? We read this book right here. We read the Bible. So let's take a look at the command to be baptized as believers and what God's Word says about that and how that applies to our lives. In Matthew chapter 28, we see Jesus' resurrection. We see him leaving the earth. The last words or instruction that anyone gives are important and these are too this is not a suggestion this is a command and Jesus came and said to them in verse 18 of Matthew chapter 28 all authority all authority he says in heaven and on earth has been given to me go there and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. This is not really all that complicated, but it's pretty clear here that we're to share the gospel, right? Make followers, disciples, and as a church, in making those disciples after they, people have become believers and become disciples, we're to baptize them. Very plain. He makes it plain, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And that is in this book. 
Jesus taught them much over the three years that he spent with them, and the apostles were to share that um, and what we have today, the Word of God. So if we want to um, enact love and obedience for our Savior, we need to know his Word. We need to study his Word. We need to be here when uh, there are opportunities to learn his Word. Uh, but not only that, as we already saw in Deuteronomy, we're to open this book in our homes. We're to be able to teach it to our children and to our grandchildren. In Acts chapter 2, we see Peter preaching his first sermon here. And in verse 37, as he's preaching, the peop these people say, Brothers, what shall we do? And he says, Repent, okay? Come to know Christ and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. So those who receive his word, those who received it, okay, who repented of their sin, accepted the fact that they were sinners and couldn't save themselves, were baptized. <clears throat> we see receiving the word in repentance followed by a baptism here. The Great Commission was giving the command to baptize to the church. And here the command we see, as Peter preaches, is to these individuals that they are to be baptized. It's not a suggestion from the commander-in-chief, but a command that he left. It's important or it wouldn't be here. In Acts chapter 8, we see the Ethiopian eunuch, along with Philip. In, uh, in Acts chapter 8, verse 35, he said, Then Philip opened his mouth, and beginning with the scripture, he told them the good news about Jesus. He told them, this man accepted that, and going along the road, when they came to some water, he said, See, here is water. This is the uh, eunuch speaking. See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down. It says you're into the water. Okay? Philip didn't go down and fill a little pot with water and come up and dump it over his head. He didn't go down and fill a little pot with water and sprinkle it over his head. No. They went down into the water, Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. It's obvious from what we see here that this man believed and then requested to be baptized as an expression of his faith and obedience. Baptism is followed by salvation. Some, and this man was baptized the same day, was very closely after he accepted the Lord. And some churches do that. Uh, we don't do that here necessarily, but um, it's important, obviously, to be baptized. So what about the form of baptism? Let's take a look at the history first. If you were a Gentile in the Old Testament um, and you wanted to join God's people, uh, you were required to go through three steps to complete the process. Gentiles who wanted this were called proselytes. And number one was circumcision. And certainly that's a huge commitment, uh, identifying with God's people. Second was baptism by immersion. This was to signify the death of the old life, and that you are now going to leave that behind and you were going to follow God. And then there was the shedding of blood which took place. Uh, there is no remission of sin without the shedding of blood, we're told in Scripture. Animal sacrifice had to take place, and it pictured the sacrifice that would come, that Christ would make himself. So baptism by immersion was not unknown to Israel, but was not practiced by the Jewish people themselves. Uh, that was until John the Baptizer came along. Uh, if you'll remember, between the book of Malachi and the book of Matthew, there were 400 years where God did not speak to his people. He had, they had absolutely no relationship with God himself. That was until John the Baptizer came along. He offered uh, baptism by immersion to Jews who needed to show repentance. This is how the New Testament opens up with John's baptism. Not the same baptism that we have today. This was God's people, the Jewish people, who came to be baptized to show uh, their repentance. John is the forerunner of Christ. He is the herald sent by God to announce the kingdom was at hand and the Messiah was here. 
we read that people were going out to him and being baptized. To the Jew, this baptism, baptism was humbling. This, before this, was always for the Gentile. It's interesting that baptism does have a humbling effect on many of us. It's humbling and sometimes difficult, especially as we age, but it's expected. It is a command. We will see as we read in a few minutes of Jesus himself, the sinless Son of God humbled himself and was baptized alongside sinners in the Jordan. It's also interesting that most of us in America today were baptized as babies. I was baptized as a baby. If we went to the nastiest places in our nation, we went down into the inner city where people are being shot all the time and asked the question, have you been baptized? Most of those people would say, yes, I was baptized as a baby. I don't believe that this is baptism in a true sense. It's more like a christening, I guess you could say. Pado or infant baptism is found nowhere, nowhere in Scripture. We don't see it anywhere. It simply is not found as part of any ceremony in Scripture. It is tradition in our culture and in many denominations. We are, <clears throat> there's nothing wrong with dedicating a ch child to God, uh, but that is really a ceremony of the parents dedicating themselves to raise that child um, as God instructs. We are specific that we believe in immersion as the form, and it is believer's baptism. After you come to know Christ, babies do not have the ability to put their faith in Christ, but we as adults do. We're taught in Scripture that it is a form of showing our faith, our love, our obedience to our Savior. Again, a system. I held my little grandchild who was much smaller than I thought he was going to be. <laughs> Not a tiny little thing with tiny little toes and fingers and everything was sweet, but he can't understand. I could sprinkle water on him and he'd start crying, probably. But it has absolutely no salvation in that water. Let's look at the biblical uh, Greek language that, that is there. And it, and I'm not um, a Greek scholar by any means, but I, I do have the ability to go on my computer, and it's amazing what you can do on your computer today. And uh, looking at the words and the root meaning of the words, um, it, it really is um, something. Much has been said about the words used in the New Testament for the word baptized. Uh, bapto, baptizo, uh, if you were to go to a biblical whole Greek lexicon and see these words and how they're defined um, as immersion or to dip, there's no doubt in my mind after studying this over the last month that the Greek baptizo means to immerse, bapto means to dip. I even found a, uh, uh, an is uh, 2,000 year old recipe for uh, pickles that referred to these words in Greek as to how to make the pickles. Now we all know that pickles are what? They're immersed, right? Uh, so very interesting. But I, I also read a lot over the last month about other denominations, and it's interesting to read the comment that, that many of these, and I actually read this, uh, they believe that baptism, or the words used in, in, the, uh, in Scripture, in the Greek, mean immersion, immersion. But they also said, well, it also means to hold. Well, you know, that's like uh, arguing whether the sky is blue or green. I, you know, it's, it's I guess, however you want to change it, you can change it. The original Greek definitely means to immerse. Uh, the argument that it means to pour is an argument you just can't win. I found it amazing that the Orthodox Church in Europe immerses babies. You can go on YouTube and watch it. They take a little baby like my grandson and just right in the water and out. Again, it really has no meaning for the salvation of that child. Uh, um, it's actually quite entertaining to watch, to be honest with you. But, um, I should also mention that the word baptism is used in Scripture 
In other ways, we see the word, the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's when we are immersed into the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is immersed into us when we accept Christ. That is when the Spirit of God immerses us into the body of Christ. I'm not going to spend any more time on this, but um, do the study in the Greek. Uh, go to uh, places like Blue Letter Bible, and, and they let you go into the Strong's Concordance, and you can look at the actual words, and they even pronounce them for you. And I know if you've ever been in any classes that I've taught here, sometimes I'll pronounce the words in Greek. It has nothing to do, I barely know the English language, but I went on and I wrote it phonetically so that I could say it. Um, so it's amazing what you can get on your, uh, on your computer. Let's look at, at some examples of baptism in, in Scripture. We talked about God using symbols throughout Scripture, the rainbow, the Passover, the rocks. Um, there was a purpose as an object lesson to teach from, and, and I believe that it is what God uh, does with baptism also. It's a symbol. It's a, a one-time expression of our newfound faith as we identify with uh, Christ as our Lord. It's a, it's a symbol. Baptism by immersion illustrates Christ's death and his resurrection. We burial and resurrection. Christ died for our sin. He was buried and he rose again, we're told in Scripture. Why did God choose this as a command? As a symbol. Immersion symbolizes a new life as a result of repentance. And that's what was happening with John as he baptized. Uh, in Matthew chapter 3, we see a description of this. John the Baptist came preaching in, in the wilderness, we're told. And his words were, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Again, this is a different baptism. It is uh, actually entering in the kingdom that, uh, that Christ is bringing upon the earth at that time, okay? The kingdom of heaven is at hand. And then Jerusalem and all Judea, it says there, uh, all the region went out into the Jordan to John and were baptized in the river Jordan, confessing their sins in the river, okay? <clears throat> he didn't bring a bottle of water up and sprinkle some on them. And then it says in verse 7, when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. My son, when he was in the military, they had a, a military motto, deeds, not words. It's what you do, it's not what you say. Um, these people, these Pharisees, these Sadducees that were coming to John, he knew they weren't really repenting. They were just coming to be part of what the people were doing. It's a symbol of repentance here. And he says to them, do not presume to save yourselves. We have Abraham as our father. He says, God's able to take these stones here and make children of his if he wants. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. He's saying to these people, you can say whatever you want to say, but you're not living it. You're not repentant. And you're going to be thrown into a fire, right? Because he goes on to say, I baptize you people with water for repentance. But he, was, who, he who is coming, Jesus, after me is mightier than I with sandals. I'm not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, talking to these people who are repenting, and with fire. So the word baptize here that we find in Scripture is not only referring to being baptized or immersed with the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ, but it's also being referred to those who aren't repenting to what? Being immersed into a lake of fire that we read about in Scripture. We baptize some of you by the Holy Spirit, some of you by fire. The fire is judgment that is to come. He will divide those who truly repented and those who did not truly repent and will be judged with a baptism of fire. We read about that in the book of Revelation, that, lack, uh, that lake of fire. 
a pit that Satan and his people will be thrown into. Why do I make this point? It is the word baptism by fire. It means immerse into fire. Why well, use the word baptism for this? It means immersion. It doesn't mean to sprinkle somebody with fire or pour some fire on somebody. It says exactly what it means. I'm not going to read a lot of this, but it also goes in here, uh, verse 13, talking about Jesus being baptized. In verse 16, it says, and when Jesus was baptized, immediately he went up from the water. So you don't come up from water if you're not in water, right? <clears throat> so baptism uh, is by immersion in Mark. We read, John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And then it says, in the Jordan River. They were in the water. In John chapter 3, we read, John also was baptizing at Anon, near Selim, because the water was plentiful there. So the final analysis, what, what is the final analysis on all this, on baptism or not to baptize? It's certainly the final decision is up to you. I believe that believers' baptism by immersion is taught in Scripture um, by the founders of this church here um, as the correct choice. I also believe that Satan has taken the opportunity for centuries to confuse the issue. Why? Because he loves nothing more than to confuse us and to keep us from obedience. It's up to us to search the scriptures and know what is correct. In the final analysis, we will stand or most likely be laying on our faces before a Savior someday who gave, us, gave his life for us. Will we appear as those who are obedient or will we be there in, in shame because we weren't willing to be obedient? the one who gave his life for us. We will all appear someday before God on an answer for whatever obedience or disobedience that we have in all areas of our lives. We need to be comfortable uh, with what our answer might be. May the Lord bless the reading, the teaching, and the preaching of his word today. We're going to go into the next portion of our service here, the Lord's Table. Uh, as we do, I just want to make sure everyone has one. If you don't, um, certainly let us know, and we'll make sure you get one. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure that he would give his only son to make a wretch his treasure. How great the pain of searing loss, the Father turns his face away as wounds which mar the chosen one bring many sons to glory. Behold the man upon the cross, my sin upon his shoulders. Ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers. It was my sin that held him there until it was accomplished. His dying breath has brought me life. I know that it is finished. I will not boast in anything, no gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, his death and resurrection. Why should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer. But this I know with all my heart, his wounds have paid my ransom. As we prepare, I want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person, let each one of us examine ourselves, then so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And here's the warning, for if anyone eats and drinks without discerning the body of Christ, eats and drinks judgment, upon himself. That is why many of you are weak and ill, and some have died. But if we judge ourselves truly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined, so that we may not be condemned along with the world. Let's take a, a few moments to
to pray, go before the Lord. If you have business before God, now's the time to take care of it. Um, in, in confession uh, for our sin. Let's just take a few moments. says, for I received from the Lord, verse 23 of 1 Corinthians um, 11. It says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Father, we thank you again for uh, this wonderful day as we uh, partake in the Lord's table in remembrance of the sacrifice that was made for our sin. Lord, it's so important that, um, that we obey your word. And uh, Lord, we just pray that you give uh, all of us the wisdom to do so throughout this week. We thank you for the blood, the body that was sacrificed for us. In Jesus' name. Thank you.